went to accounting Thomas Jefferson because Thomas Jefferson was the author of all of those quotes. Thomas Jefferson, probably the smartest president ever. Thomas Jefferson, one of our greatest presidents ever. But I think we'd lose him. I think we'd lose him in 2010. We would lose the author of the Declaration of Independence because he dared to think independently. Some guy in a powdered wig who's been dead for a couple hundred years is more modern in his thinking than we are. That's where we are in America today, and it's a tragic situation for all of us. And we have to ask, how did we get here? Well, here's one clue. The 1984 Republican Convention opened with a prayer, of course. Thousands in the hall at the convention in 1984. Millions watching on TV. And here's what the minister said, quote, there is no such thing as the separation of church and state. It is merely a figment of the imagination of infidels. Infidels, I guess, meaning Thomas Jefferson, who was the person who origin originated the phrase separation of church and state. Now consider this quote. In no instance have the churches been the guardians of the liberties of the people. James Madison, father of the Constitution. James Madison, you know, Jefferson, everybody talks about Jefferson, right? I mean, he was the guy who said separation of church and state. James Madison said total separation of church and state. That's what James Madison said. Thomas Jefferson could, you know, play the violin. He was tall. He was handsome. The chicks really dug him, right? You know, that, that was Thomas Jefferson. James Madison was short, kind of fat, uh, you know, not as much of a rock star. But James Madison rocked when it came to understanding what our Constitution was about. Recently, we, at the Secular Coalition for America, we were kind of pleased because President Obama makes less of a big deal of the National Day of Prayer than did his predecessor. James Madison opposed the existence of National Days of Prayer. The Secular Coalition for America today, in the 21st century, is lobbying right now to try to stop proselytizing by military chaplains to our men and women in uniform. James Madison said he opposed the existence of chaplains even to open the Congress. Because why? He said that that automatically leads to majority tyranny. And of course, he's right. I mean, is, is it going to be the, the Sikhs that are going to be opening a lot of the sessions? No. No, that's not the situation. It leads to majority tyranny, and James Madison was exactly right. The Secular Coalition for America, right now, we're lobbying on your behalf to stop funding for so-called faith-based initiatives. They get tax money and then carry out religious functions with that tax money. We oppose that on your behalf. James Madison, when there wasn't one penny, not one penny of federal money, opposed giving to a church a governmental function even when there was no money changing hands from tax dollars because he said that it was too much of an intermingling of the functions of church and state and therefore it should not happen. That was James Madison. But I was in talk radio not too long ago and somebody called in and said, you know, Jefferson, Madison, those are just two guys, right? <laughs> okay, two guys. <laughs> All right, so let's take that premise. And let's, let's roll with it for a minute and say, let's go to John Adams. John Adams, who was probably the most Christian of our early presidents. Here's what John Adams said. The United States is the example of government erected on the simple principles of nature. Adams said government, our government, quote, founded on the natural authority of the people alone without a pretense of miracle or mystery, and that this is a great point gained in favor of the rights of mankind. John Adams. And it was John Adams who signed the treaty that many of you know that was unanimously approved by the U.S. Senate, that was approved by his Secretary of State that said, the U.S. government, quote, is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. And that language was approved by John Adams' predecessor, 
George Washington. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison. These are leaders and thinkers of the 1700s Enlightenment. Now, sometimes that made them lightning rods. Literally, if you think, you know, or not literally, but in a related <laughs> way, when you think about uh, Ben Franklin, because uh, Ben Franklin, as we may recall from school, invented the lightning rod. And you know what happened? He was condemned. Clergy on both sides of the Atlantic condemned Ben Franklin for inventing the lightning rod because it meant that the lightning would not hit the sinner for which it was intended. I'm not making this up. There are letters to the editor <laughs> contemporaneous at the time saying, no, that's thwarting God's will, these lightning rods. How terrible this new technology. So they had to face that. They had to face that, but remember who won. Who won? Jefferson won. Madison won. That was the kind of country we had in the Enlightenment. Well, partly because there was a much smaller percentage of Americans who were even attending church back in that era. It wasn't as common as people think. And certainly these free-thinking views were much more accepted and much more uh, prevalent than they are today. Because things started to change in the 1800s. We saw more of what we would now call the growth of fundamentalism in the 1800s. And some of the uh, more free-thinking young politicians did not get the memo that they better you know, zip their lip. One young politician said, and I'm quoting, the Bible is not my book, nor Christianity my profession. That would be Abraham Lincoln, the savior of the Union. Abraham Lincoln, who when he ran for office one time from Springfield, Illinois, all of the ministers in Springfield endorsed his opponent, Stephen Douglas. His best friend and law partner, Mr. Herndon, said that Lincoln died a non-believer. Now, I don't know. I don't know whether Lincoln believed in God or didn't, and he certainly used biblical terminology through much of his later career. But what I do know, and what is important here, is that Abraham Lincoln would have great difficulty being elected to Congress, much less President of the United States, if he were confronted with his own words, with his own free-thinking ideas and skepticism. That's what he would face. Now let's turn to the Abe Lincoln of American letters, <coughs> Mark Twain. Some people consider Huckleberry Finn to be the great American novel. And the central conflict in Huckleberry Finn was Huck going to help Jim escape slavery. And Huck knew, correctly knew, that church teachings were very clear that Huck would burn in hell forever if he were to help a slave escape. And Huck decided that he would choose to burn in hell forever and help his friend. That is the central part of this story, facing those clear church teachings regarding slavery. But Mark Twain was no less clear. Mark Twain said, and I'm quoting, if there is a God, he is a malign thug. Mark Twain also said, I cannot see how a man of any large degree of humorous perception can ever be religious. Now, I'm not saying we all have to agree with Mark Twain, but I am saying that Mark Twain has to be included. We need him included in the tapestry of American life. And one person who agreed strongly that people like Twain should be included was Jack Kennedy, who was probably the most strong church-state separationist of any president after Madison. President Kennedy, who attended mass every Sunday, perhaps because of what was going on Saturday night. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I know where he stood on the issues. And Jack Kennedy said that America is, quote, where every man has the same right to attend or not attend the church of his choice. And Kennedy said, no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference. Contrast Jack Kennedy's policies with well, what we have seen in recent decades. My favorite example is the Golden Christian School in Cleveland, Ohio. Their curriculum, with tax money, consisted solely of watching videotapes with our tax money. So I think we can say that President Kennedy was right. No tax money for religious schools. That is the correct policy. But I believe that in our taxpayer-funded schools, children should be instructed in the Bible. Absolutely. Children should be taught about the Koran. Absolutely. 
and children should be taught the Constitution of the United States of America. And then they should ask, which of these documents evolves? Which changes with time? And which documents are based on barbaric viciousness and violence and vindictiveness? America needs to be made safe. It needs to be made safe for the ideas of people like Twain and Einstein. And politics needs to be made safe for the ideas of people like Jefferson and Madison. We need to follow two golden rules. First golden rule, do not to your neighbor what you would take ill from him. You may have heard something like this attributed to Jesus Christ, and good for him. But this quote comes from Pittacus, five centuries before Christ. A second golden rule, the Constitution of the United States of America, particularly Article 6, Section 3, which says that federal officials, quote, shall be bound to support the Constitution, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under these United States. See, the beauty, the beauty of our Constitution was that Madison designed it based on a theory of evolution. The Bible and the Koran, they reject evolution. Not just in a scientific sense, they reject it in a humanistic sense. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what more human beings learn. It doesn't matter what interactions we have. It doesn't matter how much we attempt to ennoble ourselves or improve ourselves. What those documents say is blacks, women, gay people, sorry, your application was received 2,000 years too late. Tough for you. But Madison's genius, Madison's genius was his humbleness. His humbleness in knowing that what he knew in 1787 wasn't all there was to know and that he was willing to see things evolve and change. You know, I believe that Darwin and Einstein produced real books of revelation. And if somebody here can explain to me the biblical book of revelations, let me know, because it makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. But Darwin and Einstein's books, they offered us profound, new, elegant, and marvelous ways of looking at our world and at our universe. And just as dramatically, and just as importantly, Madison offered a new way, a new set of rules for human interaction. Rules that bend toward increasing compassion and inclusion and justice. Like Einstein, Einstein said that light bends, and Madison said that the light of justice bends to include all people increasingly. And the light of justice is bending, and it's bending in a positive direction, I'm happy uh, to report. You know, among Americans who are 65 and older, there are approximately 7% of people in that age group who report some form of naturalistic or non-theistic or scientifically based worldview. And thank you to those uh, people on the vanguard, those early leaders.